artificial intelligence. It's something that you and I have as a, a shared interest, and it's something that our audience is interested in as well. Um, the question here is a lot of experts in AI don't share the same level of concern that you do about the dangers huh. of AI. Fools. What, what Famous last words. What, spe what specifically do you believe that they don't? Um, well, the biggest issue I see with so-called AI experts is that they, they think they know more than they do. Um, and they think they're smarter than they actually are. Um, in general, we are all much smarter than we think we are, but much less smart, dumber than we think we are, um, by a lot. So, this, is, this tends to plague, plague smart people. Um, they just can't, they define themselves by their intelligence and they, they don't like the idea that a machine could be way smarter than them, so they discount the idea, which is fundamentally flawed. That's the wishful thinking uh, situation. Um, I'm really quite close to, or I'm very close to the, to the cutting edge in AI and it scares the hell out of me. Um, it's capable of vastly more than almost anyone knows. And the rate of improvement is exponential. Um, you can see this in things like AlphaGo, which went from, in the span of maybe six to nine months, it went from being unable to beat even a reasonably good Go player to then beating the European world champion who was ranked 600, then beating Lisa Doll 4-5, um, who had been world champion for many years, then beating the current world champion, then beating everyone while playing simultaneously. Then, uh, then there was Alpha Zero, uh, which crushed Alpha Go 100 to zero. <laughs> and Alpha Zero just learned by playing itself, and it, it can play basically any game that you put the rules in for. If you, whatever rules you give it, just, it literally read the rules, play the game, and be superhuman for any game. Um, nobody expected that rate of improvement. If you ask those, so, the, those same experts uh, who think AI is not progressing at the rate that I'm saying, I think you will find that their predictions for things like Go and, and other, and, and other uh, AI advancements have, uh, their, their batting average is quite weak. It's not good. Um, the, the, we'll see this also with, uh, with self-driving. Uh, I think probably by end of next year, self-driving will be, will encompass essentially all modes of driving and be at least 100 to 200% um, safer than a person by the end of next year. We're talking like maybe 18 months from now. Um, uh, NHTSA did a study on, on Tesla's autopilot version one, which is relatively primitive, and found that it was a 45% reduction in highway accidents. And that's despite autopilot one being just version one. Um, version two, I think, will be at least two or three times better. That's the current version that's running right now. Um, so the, the rate of improvement is really dramatic. Uh, we have to figure out some way to ensure that the advent of digital superintelligence is one which is symbiotic with humanity. I think that's the single biggest existential crisis that we face and the, and the most pressing one. And how do we do that? I mean, if, if we take it that it's inevitable at this point, that some version of AI is coming down the line, how do, we, how do we steer through that? Well, I, I'm not normally an advocate of regulation and oversight. I mean, I think it, one should generally err on the side of minimizing those things. But this is a case where you have a very serious danger to the public. And so therefore, there needs to be a public body that um, has insight and then oversight on, to confirm that everyone is uh, developing AI safely. Um, this is extremely important. Um, I think the danger of AI is much greater than the, the, the danger of nuclear warheads by a lot. Um, and nobody would suggest that we allow anyone to just build nuclear warheads if they want. That, that would be insane. And mark my words, AI is far more dangerous than nukes. Far. So why do we have no regulatory oversight? This is insane. What's well, a question you've been asking for a long time, and I think it's a question that's come to the forefront over the last year, 
we begin to realize that it doesn't necessarily, I think if we've, we've all been focused in on the idea of artificial superintelligence, right? Which is clearly a danger, but maybe, you know, a little further out. Um, what's happened over the last year is you've seen artificial, what I've been calling artificial stupidity. You talk about, you know, algorithmic manipulation of social media, like we're, we're in it now. It's starting, it's starting to happen. How do we, how do we, is it, what's the intervention at this point? Um. I'm not really all that worried about the short-term stuff, things that are, um, not, like narrow AI is not a species level risk. Um, it, 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 will, it will result in dislocation, uh, in lost jobs and, um, it, you know, the, the sort of better weaponry and that kind of thing. But it is not a fundamental species level risk, uh, whereas uh, digital superintelligence is. Uh, so. It's really all about laying the groundwork to make sure that if, if humanity collectively decides that creating digital superintelligence is the right move, then we should do so very, very carefully. Um, very, very carefully. Um, this is the most important thing that we could possibly do. But but how I mean on a, re a regular day for you are you are you are you sleeping you're not sleeping a lot right? Well, oh, geez, do I look that bad? <laughs> no, um, you look great. Oh, but thanks. we just imagine with the amount of responsibilities, with the amount of you know with, with what you've got going on, do these problems still keep you up at night, or do you think we're on our way to solving them? Well, right now the only things that are really stressing me out in a big way are AI, obviously. Um, that's like always there, and uh, and. Um, I'm working really hard on Tesla Model 3 production, um, and uh, we're making good progress, but it's hugely hard work. But those are the two most stressful things in my life right now. Yeah. What do you hope the world will look like for children born today when they're your age? When, sorry? What do you hope for the world to look like? What's the best case scenario? Say we solve these problems. What's that world look like? And that AI risk is that I guess there's this sort of a benign AI and that we're able to achieve a symbiosis with that AI. Um, ideally, the AI, uh, there's somebody who, I can't remember his name, but had a good suggestion for what the um, optimization of the AI should be, what's its utility function. Um, you have to be careful about this because if you say maximize happiness, and the AI concludes that happiness is a function of dopamine and serotonin, so it captures all humans and jacks your brain with large amounts of dopamine and serotonin. <laughs> like, okay, it's not what we meant. <laughs> it sounds pretty good, though. <laughs> oh, you'll love it. <laughs> um, well, I like the definition of, like, the AI should try to maximize the freedom of action of, of humanity. Um, maximize the freedom of action. Maximize freedom, essentially. Um, I like that definition. Um, but we, we do want a close coupling between collective human intelligence and digital intelligence. Um, and uh, Neuralink is trying to help in that regard by um, creating a, an interface between, um, a high bandwidth interface between AI and, your, and human brain. Um, you know, we're already, we're already a cyborg in the sense that, uh, that your phone and your computer are kind of an extension of you. Um, just low bandwidth input output. Right? Exactly, it's just low bandwidth, um, particularly output. I mean, two thumbs, basically. Um, so how do we solve that problem? The, the band, bandwidth thing? The bandwidth issue. <laughs> I mean, we've all, we've all succumbed to it now. We're all, we're all cyborgs. We're just low-efficiency cyborgs. So how do, we, how do we make it better? I think we've got to build a... We've got to build an interface. Um, like, we didn't evolve to have a communications jack. Um, you know, or, or some... So that there's got to be essentially vast numbers of, of, of tiny electrodes uh, it, that are able to read write from your brain. Of course, you know, security is pretty important in this situation, to say the least. Um, I was gonna say, I'm not coming with, I'm keeping my brain air-gapped. Yeah, well I think a lot of people will choose to do that. 
Um, but um, it's a bit like Ian Banks' Neural Lace, mm -hmm. but, not, but in, in the case of Neural Lace, it's sort of, that, that's there from when you're born, or it, it's sort of, it's not a, it's, it's more a of a, sorry? It's a backup. Yeah, kind of a backup. Um, this would be, there's, there's a digital extension of you uh, that is an AI, the AI extension of you, uh, a tertiary layer of intelligence. Um, so you've got your limbic system, your cortex, and, and the tertiary layer, which is the digital AI extension of you, and that high bandwidth connection is what um, achieves a tight symbiosis. I, I think that's the best outcome. I, I hope so. If anybody's got better ideas, I'd love to hear it.